Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. I'm Adam. Thanks for hanging out with me again today. So today we're going to take a look back at the monogram tornado, this guy. So recently, RC Elf was kind enough to send this over to me. Um, this is a kit that I have never heard of, nor really never seen. So um, getting it in my hands and, you know, taking it out of the package was kind of a, a once in a lifetime thing, of course. Um, so apologies for that video. It was a little scatterbrained and all over the place because I was seeing it the first time as you guys were unboxing it. And, you know, the brain was more focused on this than, you know, words coming out. So hopefully this will be a little bit better. Um, but the tornado does come in the red and it also came in a yellow um, body as well. I personally like the red, but the yellow actually does look kind of cool. So the red, I think, looks personally better because, you know, basically it's a hotshot clone. Um... It's, it's a not a great hotshot clone. Um, you know, they took some liberties with it and made it their own. So it did kind of take away a little bit of the hotshotness, but it definitely is a hotshot clone. So let me get this wire out of the way. So here is the buggy. Now, I have not done anything to this since the last video. Um, I have not taken it apart. I haven't done anything with it. So we're going to start, you know, popping things off. And um kind of as we're doing that i'll go through a little bit of history so this came out in 1986 um right along a bandai interceptor so i'm not 100 percent sure i think the bandai interceptor was made first and then monogram basically had them made for monogram so it removed all the bandai markings off of it and added the monogram logo. So basically like in the bumper and then some of the, the molding pieces got rid of the Bandai and went to monogram. There was also at some point um, kind of a, a, a three-way split between Bandai, monogram, and MRC all making kind of the same models or using the same model under different names. Um, you know, the story gets a little fuzzy, but at one time there was another one made by... Bandai called the Mad Wolf that was also released under the monogram name and those two were like identical just like these were um, <clears throat> Now as far as the MRC coming into the play, I'm not sure But again, you know, we're gonna focus on this one and there's not a ton of information about it So we're just gonna have to dig into this guy and take a look now one thing I did hear um, or read uh, research in this is these bodies were terribly fragile um, there's not a whole lot holding this front end together, and the only thing holding the body down is this center body pin. So that is literally the only thing holding all of this body shell on, and evidently it was very prone to splitting, uh, basically getting little micro fractures in this plastic, and then just basically splitting in half. Um, which, you know, there is not a whole lot of plastic here. It is a fairly... Um, rigid, like, ABS-type plastic. I'm not 100% sure what it is. Um... It has no markings in here to what type of plastic it is. And, you know, it's injection molded, so it's probably something like ABS or whatever. Um, but, you know, there's just not a lot of meat or any reinforcement in that body mount area. So I can see where these probably did get trashed pretty quickly. Now, the kit does come with um, decals, so you can decal it up either as much or as little as you want. Um, we haven't gone that route yet. Now, it does have friction shocks on there, but you have two up front and two in the rear. Um, now, instead of having the hot shot where it had the one right across the front, they opted to do push rod, rear suspension, both front and rear. And I'll put some up close pictures in here. Uh, but essentially, the push rod mounts to the suspension arm, comes up, hits the lever up here, and then compresses the shot. Now, the fronts are very, very light. You know, it takes hardly anything to push this thing down. So, like I said in the previous video, I am pretty sure this whole front end... Um, after some good running is going to get shredded up. You know, there's going to be scars and scrapes and stuff all over the place. Now it does have a big front bumper slash skid plate that, you know, looks very tough. Um, it is a softer plastic, so it's not, it shouldn't break right away. Um, so it should take some abuse. Now it does have plastic push rods. It has plastic steering linkages, um, all the way around. The drive shafts are metal and I believe... So it does have dog bones front and rear. So it has metal drive shafts, metal cups coming out of the diffs, metal um, axles in the hubs. Um, I believe this is all bushed. Let me take a wheel off and we'll check. Boy. 
So it does have the little tri-star um, wheel spokes. So there's nothing on the back to locate it except for the three holes. But you line that up, get your three holes in, and it's started. Now this doesn't have the cross pin. This has the grooved um, axle shaft. So I can see these getting stripped out pretty well. Um, you know, it's basically like servo spline in there. So, you know, you spin up a wheel really hard and it comes down, it's liable to strip out those splines in this plastic and then you're down to kind of three wheel drive or having to glue these onto the axles. Um, I don't know, it's hard to tell. Uh, there's a big E-clip holding the axle stub in, but it looks like, yeah, there's just bushings in there. They're just black plastic bushings, unless there's a cap on here, which I don't see. But it does have brass um, balls for the steering and brass um, pivot balls for the front suspension. Now I do see where this has basically been unloaded for a long time because it's basically sitting on styrofoam in the car. The steering arms have some droop to them where they've been kind of hanging down for so long, which, you know, for the little bit of running we're going to do with it, not a big deal. Um, the knuckles are a softer plastic, so the steering uh, knuckle up here is a softer plastic. I just pulled off a little piece of flashing and it was like really stretchy, so those should hold up. Uh, steering rods, you know, they are flexible. The suspension arms, the suspension strut rods are flexible. Um, the, there's a decent amount of flex to the front uh, suspension arm, so they should hold up well. So one interesting thing about this is the motor doesn't sit back here on the differential. It doesn't sit up front uh, sideways. It's longitudinal in the um, chassis here. Um, I'm assuming they did that to allow for this rear suspension to mount up here because you know you have all this stuff back here there's really no place to put the motor um why they didn't mount it up high and sideways i'm not sure but it does have the big resistor on here so evidently this has some sort of mechanical speed control in it or you know it's just using that um off of the circuit board to bleed off extra power uh, but you do have like a little plastic cage on here so i guess if the body broke and you were running it without the body, you wouldn't be able to, you know, directly put your hand on the, the um, resistor. So the rear hex, I mean, the rear hubs are, you know, very similar to the front where you basically have the axle stub coming through, a big E-clip um, holding the axle shaft in there, and then you have plastic bushings. I don't see any bearings in here at all. All right, I'm going to stop the video, and I'm going to tear off, you know, most of this and, you know, see what we're working with on the guts. All right, guys, we've jumped down to the handheld, and so we've taken out all these. So basically, the, you have a washer head, self-tapper, holding down the roll bar and some of the other components. Then you've got long machine screws and nuts, two in the front, two in the rear. So those machine screws go through those holes that hold the rear and the front end to the car. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about that once I get it put back together. But then you have basically two different size screws, looks about an 8 mil and around a 10 mil um, self-tapper. And that's pretty much everything that's holding all this together. So let's take a look at some of the internals. So we have a stepped servo. So this is very similar to something that you would see in like a Radio Shack car or something like that. There is a, you know, a split washer type servo saver on there. You know, I didn't pull the whole front end off. I didn't want to disassemble the entire assembly. This is your input shaft to the front diff. So you spin that, you can see the wheels turn. Now, this is your drive shaft. So that little tiny paddle lines up in the slot in there and goes from the front to the rear. And the rear actually has the motor attached. So this is the driven gears. And then the, the little tiny output is in there. Goes into this little spoon end go down the drivetrain, hits the front spoon, and then turns the front drive shaft. So if you thought the little, you know, looped in antenna rod um, type drive shaft for the hot shot was a little uh, chintzy, um, this guy is, you know, super thin and fragile. You know, I can see those little ends getting sheared off because that metal was put underneath of a lot of stress getting smashed out like that. So I'm assuming, you know, that was probably a failure point at some point. 
Um, so, you know, you have your servo down there. You have your four battery slots for the AA batteries to run the radio side of things. And then the slot down here for your 7.2 pack delay. So then you have your main receiver board up here. So it's a good three inches by three inches, roughly. And you have another step servo up here, which actually has the mechanical speed control hooked directly to it. So this is a true um, mechanical speed control car. So there is no electronic um, um, uh, electronic speed control on here. It's all manually speed controlled. Both of them are a five wire um, servo. So in order to upgrade this to hobby grade, it would take a lot of effort and time. And there's plenty of room to do it, but you know, I'm not intending on beating this up and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, but then you have your switch and your light. Now this is actually soldered into, um, the board here. So I would have to unsolder that to be able to get that light out. So unfortunately we got to put the car back together, pull the driver head off of this guy and the driver head goes together just like a Tamiya driver and be able to pull his head off with that screw paint the head, paint the body, and then get everything put back together. But overall, you know, it's very similar to a hot shot. Basically you have the rear pod driving the rear wheels, drive shaft going forward to the front pod, front pods driving the front wheels. Um, just a whole lot different proprietary electronics through here. But it is kind of cool. I've never seen a, uh, I've never seen a toy grade RC with an actual mechanical speed control in it. Most of the time it's just all done on the board. Um, it's like an integrated receiver uh, speed controller in one. Um, basically I, this, I had to take this off to be able to you know, get in here and take a look. I basically just fight, slide the driver figure back up through the hole and then this whole thing drops down and the front end attaches through those slots. So this is all screwed down to the main chassis and the front end gets attached by those two slots there going through the holes in the front end. All right, I'm gonna get this guy stuck back together because I'm not gonna take the diffs apart. Um, we're just gonna run it as is. So let me get this back together and then we'll step out and talk about it for a little bit. So one thing I did notice when I went to take it apart, the front end was mounted pretty snugly. Like there was no real movement in the front end. You know, it's all pretty rigid. The rear end, however, and I'll try to get this to where I'm not moving it. Um, so now I got this up to where I can hold this still. And like I said, you basically just have two bolts or two machine screws going through and holding that on. Now this is what you get when you got when I got it out of the box. You know, there's a lot of movement in there and that much movement as it's bouncing around is just going to add extra stress and start cracking that plastic. So I did notice that it was loose. So when you tighten up the rear end, you can make it tighter. Now this little, let me turn this back around. Whoa, professionalism. So this little motor wedgie is what we're gonna term this. This is gonna now be the official term. This is the motor wedgie. The motor wedgie goes in and this slot here goes over the drive shaft lump. This slot here cradles the motor and then this edge here braces out on this point. So if you tilt back, you can slide that in and it kind of locks into place. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and install this. They give you two in the bag of accessories. Now in those instructions, it says, if you plan on running this in an off-road situation where there's gonna be a lot of bouncing and jumping, then install that little piece. Now it doesn't tell you how to install that little piece, but basically you loosen up those screws just a tiny bit it, pitch, it allows you to pitch the motor back and then you can get that in there. So now let me spin this around so I can tighten it up and we'll push down on that. And now I'm not tightening them up, you know, like I'm not manhandling them tight, but I'm getting them as tight as I can. Yeah, so that definitely helped. So now, you know, we can hold this still and there's a little bit of movement, but it is greatly reduced to where, you know, now this, when this end compresses, the motor is now pressing down on this and pressing on the chassis plate. So it's definitely bracing it all in all. What they really needed to do was have some sort of bracing coming from the chassis plate here back to this assembly somehow. I know it would have been very difficult and basically they're using this 
as a connector. So basically that goes on like that. So you get two screws here, a screw here and a screw here on each side. And then this screws down to the chassis. So as long as this is on there good and tight, it should brace it up fairly well. Now, you know, over time screws will get loose and everything. And I'm sure, you know, the more you run it, the more it's going to loosen up. Again, I'm not going to run this a terrible lot. So, you know, that's going to be not a worry I'm going to have now that everything is tight. Um, so for right now, I did get the driver head, oops, I did get the driver head out, and he's a little bit different than a Tamiya guy, um, and I'll get an up-close picture, he actually looks like some Space Ranger or something with his helmet, it looks like something out of like Modern Warfare or whatever that game is, it looks like Master Chief, <laughs> um, I'm gonna get him painted, I'm gonna bring out some white paint and just paint up the little body figure and put some, uh, red stripes on him uh, for his seat belts, you know, typical Tamiya driver paint job, get that on. And then once he's painted and I can get the head back on, then we'll get everything wrapped up and put back together and then take it out for a run. So let me go do some painting. And with the magic of woo, YouTube, we'll be right back. Well, all right, everybody. So we've got it back together, which was a feat in itself. I have the driver interior painted with the helmet and everything. And I have to say, I like the driver head on this guy. It's a, got more detail than the Tamiya one does. The face is almost identical, but the helmet actually has more, you know, flair and, you know, interesting bits to it than just kind of that bowling ball round helmet that most of them have. But, you know, it's very similar. It painted up no problem. Um, like I said, the only issue with painting was this little switch cover plate up top is kind of fixed in there because of the way that light is. Basically you have the light coming in through the top with the wires coming down and then you have the wires coming up from the bottom that are soldered to it. So I'd have to unsolder the wires to actually take that plate completely out of there. So we just left it in there and I just had to work around everything. Um, did put the motor brace in and now it is sitting here ready to go. Um, we got the ginormous antenna tube <laughs> sticking here. Um, but it's ready to go. It has the nickel metal hydride pack in it, and it has four AA batteries. So it's got a little bit of weight to it. You know, you know, just the buggy itself is a little on the heavier side, and then throw all the batteries in there, and it's, it feels hefty. Now, the only concern I have about that is, you know, we have that. It, you know, it was sitting up like that, which was a little too high. Now, when you compress it, you know, there's a finger width of clearance underneath of that front skid plate and, you know, maybe an inch in the rear, underneath the rear housing. But, you know, up underneath here, I can run my fingers through and I can feel the chassis the whole way. So it does squish down a lot. And the rear end seems to be pretty good. You know, it comes back up. This front end, you know, has no support to it at all. So unfortunately, when we're running it around, it's going to be just scooting that front end all over the place. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some blue tape underneath here and down the chassis just to try to protect it from getting so scraped and scratched up. You know, I, I'm only going to run this once in a blue moon and mostly probably for the run video. Um, you know, I may take it out occasionally afterwards, but again, my biggest concern is this body, um, is not going to take a rollover very well. Um, I've read a little bit more and it seems like cracking up here is very common, especially now that they're getting old. And again, I don't really, there's no good way to, um, pick this up. Now I know everybody's out there going, just add some collars, add some collars. I thought of that, but the problem is, is these springs are really stiff already. So there's a lot of tension on here. And basically your front arm, the rock arms come up, push on the, the shocks. And then there's a single mounting point back here. And all it has is two self-tapping screws going into that top deck. And it's not, it would have been better if the screws were before and after this support rod, but they're both kind of after it. So you have a tremendous amount of weight pushing back so your screws are here and your pivot point is like where my head is and you're pushing here. So that thing just wants to lean back. So I'm afraid if I put any more tension on here, there's a chance of snapping this off or stripping out those screw holes, breaking something up in here where that suspension mounts. So like I said, we're going to put some skid plate protective material. 
aka blue painter's tape <laughs> underneath. So we're going to cover this up really well. Um, unfortunately, the sun is setting today. Um, I had a whole bunch of other stuff I had to get done today. Um, not here, unfortunately. So I got everything put back together. Once I got the, the painted head ready, got everything put back together. So I'm going to get this thing ready to run. We're going to take it out tomorrow. So the next time you see this, it will be running. I hope you guys enjoyed it. This is definitely a new one to me. First time I've known about monogram building RCs or Bandai building RCs for that matter. Um, MRC, I knew they were in the game and you know, I know they got theirs from different suppliers um, over the years. You know, they dealt with Tamiya, they dealt with, you know, obviously Bandai and stuff. So it's just very interesting on how, you know, crisscrossing and divergental you know, everything was back in the 80s when everybody wanted to make RCs and, you know, it seemed like there was a handful of companies that actually could. So they just started making them for everybody and, and rebranding and all that stuff. But the cool thing is, you know, it has the monogram across the bumper and then underneath it has Bandai down here. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of neat. Really, I didn't see any other branding or marking on it other than that front bumper section. Everything else is basically unbranded. Um, there's no real markings or stampings or anything from either company outside of that bumper. Everybody out there, guys, be happy, be healthy, be safe, and I will catch you on the next one. Antenna tube was in my way. is you have a longitudinally, longitudinally mounted longitudinally